Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to today's podcast. This being episode 404. <sighs> One day we'll be saying episode 1000. Yeah, hopefully. God willing, we'll be alive around then. I don't know. There's a part of me that's like, hopefully. Well, that sounds cool, you know, to like have that long of a run. But also sounds... There's a part of me that's like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> if we reached that point, if we reached a thousand episodes, that would represent about ten years solid of podcasting at the current pace. That's crazy, man. That'd be a long time, bro. Yep. I'm not even sure you'd still be alive at that point. <laughs> at the at the rate you're aging. <laughs> yeah, you know. <clears throat> living on borrowed time. <laughs> It's so fun to pick on you these days. It's good. It's good. I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, says Tris. I'm guessing, you know, that might have I might have crossed a line there. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Sorry, I'm just uh 1000 for the win. <laughs> Be pretty cool. Uh so Today we're going to be talking about shooting and moving uh, with purpose, actually. Uh, so the other day we did, uh, or I did a Facebook Live and said, hey guys, podcast is delayed a day, uh, but we're looking for uh, any comments, questions, you know, topic ideas, whatever. And there was a couple of you that kept talking about, well, let's, let's do getting off the X or get off the X. <clears throat> so... Uh, we actually did an episode with James Yeager way back, episode 158. Uh, and that's, to my knowledge, getting off the X <clears throat> is a phrase. Well, I, I think James Yeager coined that specific usage of the phrase. I could be wrong in that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, getting off the X, you know, getting off of uh, getting your feet moving. Right, but we're gonna talk about that. It'll be an interesting episode today. Not as interesting as when you had James Yeager, right? I'm not as colorful. Well, your character. beard's color. Your beard's colorful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It's, it's gradient. Gradient. I like that description. Salt and pepper. <laughs> Cammy's flying into Denver for work tomorrow. Not excited. What would be extra stuff you would take traveling? Well, just know that tomorrow we're expecting some snow, so uh, make sure you you bring the, you know, the the warmer clothing. <clears throat> so I, I imagine it's going to clear up depending on how long you're here, Cammy. It should clear up pretty quick. Uh, I think Saturday will be kind of kind of cool, but you know it'll, it'll start warming up. The snow will melt quickly. That's if it even sticks, because I don't think the temperatures are going to get low enough to to really have it stick. But, um. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, oh yeah you guys are funny appreciate you all so <laughs> uh, we'll leave matthew's beard alone we'll leave him alone i yeah. i really love the beard uh, i'm keeping it for conversation topic right <clears throat> you just look so darn smart and wise yeah, i need yeah. some help we, we need wisdom on this show <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, get the recorded portion of the show started. So let's do it in three, two, one. This is the Concealed Carry Podcast, episode number 404. And welcome to the Concealed Carry Podcast, part of the ConcealedCarry.com network. I am your host, Riley Bowman, and I'm joined today by Mr. Graybeard, Matthew Marister. Greetings, greetings, salutations. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Seems that's become your official nickname, at least with a, a few listeners. Yeah, the, so the loyal pack, the loyal, <laughs> yeah, or the mocking pack, depending which way you want to look at it. Yeah, uh, exactly. we love our Matthew Marister. Uh, we're going to need his wise, wise wisdom today with a topic like this one. Uh, we're talking today about shooting and moving with purpose, and it'll be a good one. Uh, in fact. 
we actually did kind of an, or I did an episode, I think it was just me and James Yeager in episode 158, where we talked about uh, his philosophy on this, uh, the, the coined phrase, getting off the X, you know, that sort of thing. It was actually, so a couple of days ago, we did a live, uh, or I did a live broadcast, uh, just a little live, you know, quick little phone video uh, saying, hey, you know, what, I, what, what ideas do you guys have for the podcast? What, what questions do you have? What topics do you suggest? That sort of thing. And getting off the X was something that was mentioned several times. So your wish is my command, and here we are doing that topic today. Uh, you know, I think we've covered or talked about this concept here and there. You know, spliced out across a bunch of different episodes over a period of time. Uh, it comes up. You know, talking about moving and staying uh, on your feet and all that kind of stuff, but. Uh, but to break it down into one full episode, here we are. We'll see if we survive to the other side. Um, all right, today's episode, by the way, is brought to you, sponsored by Guardian Nation. Are you guys stuck at home watching Tiger King, binge-watching all these Netflix shows? If so, hey, why not spend your time making yourself better, <laughs> improving your skill, uh, strengthening your defensive mindset, uh, we've got a ton of great content, info, videos, and resources on our website in our membership program called Guardian Nation. So I would encourage you to check out Guardian Nation at guardiannation.com if you want to learn more. And I mean, there's just there's a ton of content in there. Uh, plus, you can go back and revisit the entire library and archive of Guardian Nation live broadcasts, which are a monthly live broadcasts we do with other industry professionals. Uh, we've had so many guests, I'm not even going to bother trying to name them because there's too many, but na- many, many, many names you guys would recognize and know. So uh, head on over to GuardianNation.com, and if you need a little bit of a push, you'd like to take advantage and try it for 14 days free, then take advantage of a free day, a free 14-day trial uh, at concealedcarry.com forward slash 14 day one four D a Y. So concealedcarry.com slash that's a forward slash and uh, one four D a Y. All right. So that is today's episode sponsor <clears throat> and we're going to just keep rolling right along. Getting off the X, <laughs> shooting and moving, <laughs> moving, then shooting, shooting while moving. I don't know. Which is it? Where, where do we get started with a topic like this? And, and here's the thing. So I guess I'll start off, Matthew, by saying that when people say a lot of times getting off the X, uh, quite often that is translated into, well, if I'm going to draw my gun, I should take a sidestep to one side or the other mm-hmm. as I draw. Yeah. Is it as simple as that? Or is there more to it than that? Yeah. So, I mean... Here, here, I think we have to kind of like put it in context, right? Like some of the stuff that you do on the range isn't necessarily, I, I don't want to say like a word for word applicable to real life, right? Like you do something to understand the concept behind it on the range because you're limited in certain things. And then it, it's not a direct you know, this is a scenario, this is what you're going to do every time, or this is, you're going to take two steps and draw, or you're going to take three. It's, it's the concept of, you know, obviously, if you're being attacked or assaulted or whatever it is, you're going to be able to have a higher probability of surviving if you're moving, if you're creating distance, um, possibly even, you know, a decreasing distance, depending on the, the proximity of the attack or what it is. But Like we're talking about fights are never stagnant. They're always dynamic. They're always moving. And if you stay stagnant during an attack, you're likely going to um, put yourself at a higher risk, right? Of being assaulted or or whatever they're going to do, whether it's shooting you, stabbing you, punching you, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the concept is moving. We got, we got to start thinking about in reality moving. Right. Okay. And, and that, you know, that makes a lot of sense because if you look at fighting, just straight up fighting, you know, fist fight, whatever, uh, there's a lot of movement going on, right? Like if you are, if you are standing still flat footed in a fight, you are going to lose, uh, unless you're seven foot tall and 350 pounds and nothing, you know, 
<laughs> okay, that's unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but a fight is is you're right is dynamic. I'm always cautious using the word dynamic, but because uh, I do feel like it's overused a lot of times. But um, it is dynamic, and that is the, the idea: is that we we don't want to be standing still, flat footed um, in a fight. But now with a gun, a gun fight is still a fight. Mm-hmm. It's it's a, it may be a different fight. It's got some different elements to it for sure. Uh, almost every other fight has contact involved. A gunfight is one fight where contact is not uh, always a thing. It can be a part of it. In fact, a good number of gunfights actually at some point during the altercation have some, some physical contact. Uh, sometimes they're initiated with physical contact. But a gunfight uh, itself is does not require any contact. So it's unique for sure in that regard. All right, so again, going back to where I started, getting off the X, the, the common thing is, and you see this even in some, uh, well, you know, and, and I'll raise my hand, you know, guilty as charged. I don't know if it's uh, necessarily that bad of a thing, but uh, so I don't mean to sound negative. It's, it's not meant to be that at all, but you see a lot of classes where instructors have students uh, on a cue, whether a beep or a command, you know, go. And they begin drawing, and they step to the one side and draw, and then fire a round, mm-hmm. or a couple of rounds, or whatever the drill is, right? Sure. <clears throat> and then maybe they'll do it again, and they'll repeat, and they'll go a side step to the other direction. Now, a lot of times it's done with a bunch of students on the same line, and so you want to want it to be kind of coordinated somewhat, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then another another thing is to go ahead and maybe give the students some freedom and say, okay, on a draw, I want you to step whichever direction. Right, and you either give so much space between students that they're not going to step into each other, or uh, you know, or another approach would be to give them some ground rules that if you you know have any of these things that occur, uh, that is, you bump into somebody, you step on their foot, um, you lose control of your gun, uh, you, you need to perform a reload or anything like that, like in the course of doing this drill. There's a, I'm just throwing out a bunch of different options, like kind of rules, depending on where the skill level your students are. Um, for instance, like why did why did I mention reload? If you if you begin the drill and you're like, oh, I hit slide lock. Um, well, if these are lesser skilled, lesser experienced students, you might have a rule like if that occurs or you step on somebody's toes or you bump into somebody, your your the rule is you stop wherever you are, mm-hmm. right? Something to that effect. Okay, so then then you can give students a little bit more freedom and let them do kind of what they want to do, but you're also still having some control measures in place for safety, depending, again, on the skill level of students. All right, so that's something I've seen done in classes as well. And uh, all that's fine. And it's not a bad idea. In fact, I think it's kind of where it starts a little bit with trying to get students to first you know first begin that concept of moving and shooting or moving and drawing or whatever uh, starts I, I think I think a single step or whatever is fine like, it's a good place to start because uh, it's relatively controlled motion we're not asking them to do a lot you know we're not going from shooting and standing still to shooting and running across to the other side of the berm you know uh, we, we, we walk before we run sort of thing so um, but here's the thing, and this would be my caution, and, and, and something that I, I do see occurring from some of those classes that I observe from time to time. And that is where it becomes so ingrained, and, and you see this also in, across social media. I see it in comments and various things. I see it in social media posts. I see it in videos that go up where it's become so ingrained that every time we draw, we must sidestep. Right. And it's always one sidestep. You know, something like it just becomes this rote thing, this presentation that is done the same way, the same time, same, the same way, the same direction, even sometimes, um, every time. Mm-hmm. Does that become counterproductive? I, I think it can. It certainly can, right? Like anything that you, you practice, um, if you don't know the underlying uh, purpose of it, right? Like if you're just practicing it and saying, okay, I must take a step when I draw. And you don't understand, like, I may want to take a step. Maybe one step is enough because one step gets me 
behind cover or, or what it might be, um, maybe that is what you want to do. But maybe in a situation you can't step, right? Like you, you, you can't step or you need to take five steps or maybe you need to go closer or not, not laterally, right? Or, or, or create distance. So I think it's great to think about, okay, when I'm drawing, I'm likely going to be moving. The mm -hmm. probability of me moving while I'm drawing is, is, is probably great because most defensive gun uses occur and, and they begin at close quarters, right? Like either at contact during a physical altercation or, or very close, right? So chances are I'm going to try to make, make some distance or get to cover and that's going to involve me moving. Um, and, and as long as you have that understanding of this is what we're doing, um, then, you know, you don't practice it as, you know, a, a football play where you're going to run out five yards and turn right. And I'm going to turn and the ball is going to be there. That's not what we're practicing. We're practicing movement in the, in the sense of getting used to moving and drawing and being, uh, more fluid rather than the, the stagnant stand on the range inside, you know, uh, on the, on the firing line. And we put the gun down when we're done, we pick it up and, and, and we're the only movement is basically our upper body, right? Like mm -hmm. we're trying to break out of that route, rote type of, uh, training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I'm with you there. So here's the thing, you know, when we do things, we should always ask ourselves the question, why am I doing X thing? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, ask that about everything that you do. Why am I drawing my pistol this way? Why am I carrying like this? Why am I using this holster or that gun or this particular uh, hollow point bullet? You know, ask all of these questions. And if you don't know the why behind that, then I would seriously question, you know, what you're doing. Um, also, you might think you know the why for something you're doing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your why is, it's always such a sensitive, touchy thing, right? Because people are always like, well, you know, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> you know, uh, like that's your Whatever preference. Works best for this, you. this is my preference. You know, well, this is what works for me. Mm -hmm. and, and to an extent with a lot of things, that that is true. Like there, there's a lot of things, like every person is a little bit different. Uh, so, all right, that works best for you and in your circumstances, your situation you find yourself in, uh, your mobility issues, your, uh, the way you dress, the way, where you work, what you do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? <clears throat> There's all those things that got to be taken into account, but still I would ask the question, are you asking yourself why? And then are you asking yourself, is my why correct or is it the best why, right? Uh, for instance, I've asked this question before of somebody, and I noticed it. I was, it was uh, an associate, a friend of mine, that we were just casually uh, shooting together once. And uh, every time he drew, uh, he, he'd side, sidestep, like every time, without fail, every time. So I could tell it had become something that's really ingrained in, his, in him, you know, in, in, as part of that draw stroke process. So I asked the question, why? Well, because I'm getting off the X. Why? because by me taking that sidestep, it will make me uh, a little bit harder to hit by my adversary, by my bad guy. Is that true? Yeah. And they were like, uh, I, I, I think so. It sounds reasonable. So it's like, all right, let's, let's do a little exercise. I'm going to step seven yards away from you, 21 feet. Okay. Which arguably is a decent distance. It's a, it's a moderate distance distance for a lot of self-defense contexts, right? Seven yards, and I want you to point your finger at me, at, my, at the center of my chest, okay? All right, got it? All right. And then on some cue, and you're not going to know when it's going to come, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to move, but I'm, I want you to follow me wherever I go. And I mimic drawing, and I take a single step to the, to the side. What do you think happens with his finger? Yeah, it moves about a half an inch. Yeah, like, <laughs> did he have any problem tracking me? No, not at all. Not at all. So this is where this is what the point I'm getting at is when we ask the question why, and if you're and and we gotta also have the the right why, the correct why, a, a why that is backed by good reasoning and sound 
sound reasoning and, and good evidence, you know, that says, yeah, this is plausible. This makes sense. This this is true, or we believe it to be, you know, as as true as we as we can. Uh, and, and so to test those kind of things, right? Because a lot of things that are based in theory, and there's a lot of things that come from somebody said something that sounded good, right? And but it was never really pressure tested. So that that pressure testing a lot of times will show the f- the flaws and the faults in some of our logic and reasoning and in in the whys of behind the things that we do. Uh, and so that that is the reality of it. A single sidestep, guys, on a draw is not going to make you a that much harder of a target to hit in a gunfight. It just won't. Okay. Uh, and so if that's the, if that's your why for taking, taking that step, then I'd seriously ask that you reconsider that. Okay. So taking a step is not a bad thing, right? Again, going back to where we started this, sometimes it's a good place for people to get started. Sometimes it's the only thing you can do based on your training, uh, uh, constraints. Like you, you are only, you are primarily only able to practice, uh, at an indoor range where you don't have the option of doing a lot movement wise. So, you know, really your sidestep inside your little three foot, whatever wide shooting stall at an indoor range is really a half step. The point is, is here's, here would be my why. My why, if, if I was for, for whatever reason constrained to doing things like that would be that, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to make sure in my mind I, I'm keeping things flowing, that I'm keeping things moving, that I'm not just being flat-footed, that I'm open to the idea of moving and possibly drawing or shooting or doing whatever, okay? And so it's not a bad thing to just just get the body moving at times. But we have to be contextually accurate with with what we're doing and the why behind it. And so recently I've started using this phrase of being principle focused and context based. The idea here is that for all the things that I do as a defensive minded concealed carrier shooter, whatever, that I need to be asking myself, what are the principles behind what I do? And what is the context? What is, what, what, what am I basing this on? And that context kind of sets and determines the why. So it's asking what you're doing and is the what based on principles as opposed to dogma and is the context, the why, a good context? I've gone on too long. No, no. It, it, I mean, you're, you're, you, you know, we're walking down the path of like trying to understand, you know, we, we're not saying to throw out the movement, right? We're not saying that these things are necessarily bad things. We're, but as you're developing the picture here is that uh, it does have to be con- based off of actual context and in a purpose, right? Purposeful. So like when I think, why would I be moving? Um, a lot of times we think, okay, well, our adversary has a firearm. Well, that's not always the case. So maybe movement with a draw and I'm moving away from someone with a knife. So maybe that's a weapon of proximity, right? So maybe distance, my movement is in order to create distance or put a barrier in between something. I run on the other side of a car. Maybe that movement is all I need. It's not moving moving to uh, dodge bullets, right? It's moving to create distance, stand off against a, you know, approximate uh, weapon of proximate use, right? Um, but maybe they have a firearm and my movement is not just to create distance because it does, it is harder to shoot something in further distance, but also to seek cover or to escape a, a room or a building or, or something like that, right? So um, I think if we understand why we're moving, the purpose, what you're talking about, then we can start moving with a purpose and with understanding of, hey, it's not always going to be a step off to the side or even a step frontwards or backwards. It may be, but chances are it's not. And and, and I understand why I'm moving, the why behind what you're doing and, and exactly what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So keeping in line with what I just proposed, the, the idea of being principle focused, context based, uh, let's start establishing some context. So, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but 
let's talk about what some of the reasons might be for moving, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, let's propose a couple of different uh, options here. Um, actually, let's talk first about what are some of the directions we might move and why. So let's actually talk about the first one that comes to my mind um, based on a lot of actual footage, you know, video of shootings. And that would be moving to the rear. Mm -hmm. All right, because we see this fairly often. Why? Well, I think the why is subconsciously. Like, it's not even something we have to think about. When you are face-to-face -face with a deadly threat, your first instinct, I mean, you may have trained yourself to a point where you're also using some kind of force back, you know, at your threat, but but subconsciously what's really also happening is the brain is saying, wow, I want to get away from this mm -hmm. sure. right now. So without even thinking about it, most people will react in such a way when they are in close quarters. We're talking arm's length, maybe maybe six feet, uh, maybe a little more than that even. You know, we're talking relatively close, uh, less than the distance across uh, of, of, of a typical room uh, in a home, right? Your thought is, they're trying to hurt me. I want to get away. And so a lot of times, instinctively, people, especially police officers, we see this again and again and again and again in body cam and dash cam footage where you start backpedaling away from the threat. Yeah. Okay? Now, this is not a bad thing because in putting distance between you and them substantially decreases your likelihood of getting hurt. As far as that distance makes it harder for them to hurt you. So distance is a good thing. And so often we talk in the training context about I want to create distance, uh, especially when we're up close. Uh, so whether that's with physical tactics as far as you know, hand to hand, whether that's with a knife, whether that's with your gun and you're shooting from a retention position or whatever, right? It, it, when we're in really up close uh, distances with our threat, we want to... Our, our number one goal at that point is not even so much to put a bunch of rounds into them as it is, um, is to put enough rounds to start creating the distance and start buying me more time to start finding others or additional or better solutions with. Sure. Yeah. So, so the back pedal, that would be, let's, let's start with, and let's analyze that, Matthew. That would be the first thing I would say is this is a common movement we see in actual fights, the back pedal. Yeah, and when you're talking about backpedaling, we're typically talking about like pretty much staying in line and going directly back, right? You're not moving to an, a side angle like an, 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 an oblique. You're you're basically going straight backwards. Um, and I see this a lot, like you said, in a lot of the videos. And it seems like to me when I when I look at this, the times that it works, the backpedal works, is situations where creating distance uh, alone sort of. Uh, buys the time that they need, right? Like the, the attacker isn't aggressively gaining ground. It's like a stagnant, uh, maybe a guy pulls out a knife and, you know, dude with gun back pedals a little bit, maybe three or four steps. And the guy with a knife pretty much is immediately hit and, and drops. But whenever there's like the attacker is actively pursuing the person who's backpedaling, right? And we see this a couple times with different cop videos where the officer's like, trying to go as fast as he can backwards and the attackers coming very fast towards him and, and continuing the attack almost inevitably the officer trips hit on his own feet or something and falls like it it, it you know it happens many times mm -hmm. so it's like one of those things where sometimes backpedaling it's not the best thing but it works right like it was lucky that it worked because that pers that attack didn't pers persist right they didn't you know bring the fight to you um but when they do that backpedal is is not ideal mm -hmm. at least in, in my estimation or my you know mind yeah yep so Here's the thing with the back pedal, right? Uh, is that it usually works for about two, maybe three steps. The problem then becomes is that after you know about two steps, your acceleration, your speed that you're moving at has now got up to a point where the feet can't really keep up. 
with where your center of gravity is located, right? Our feet are shaped the way they are because they're really they're really meant for us to move forward or maybe to the side. But really, you know, the, our feet they go forward. They're in front of us. They're 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 leverage. They're little levers to work with where our center of gravity is most likely to be located. And when we start moving the center of gravity of our body back over our heels and beyond our heels, it becomes really difficult for our feet to, uh, to, to, to keep up with it. And so down we go. So if you watch a lot of, uh, especially dash cam footage works great because you can actually see from profile or something, you know, that is this cop or, you know, it's usually cops because that's the most prevalent footage we get access to. But, uh, you know, they get about two steps, maybe three, and then poop, down they go. Mm-hmm. Right. You see that again and again and again. So, uh, again, here's the thing. It may be really difficult for a lot of people to keep themselves from do, from doing that classic back pedal. The back pedal is not the best way for us to move, especially over a, a greater uh, amount of distance. The back pedal may be necessary, again, in a very short, brief, temporary instance to uh, buy us the time we need to create some valuable space that then allows us to put additional tactics into play. Mm-hmm. But if we keep it up for too long, we're going down. And that going down can be not a good thing. Uh, as far as if you were if you were to end up on your backside, not only is it tactically a very weak position to be fighting from, uh, but uh, it's also a very weak defensive position uh, in terms of if you catch any bullets going up from the bottom part of you, uh, it's going to be very bad. And... and depending on exactly where it travels and how far up it travels, may not even be survivable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it could be a really bad thing. All right, so here's the thing. For that back pedal, I think, to really be effective, the draw has to be something that initiates at the same time the back pedal begins, or maybe even slightly before. And so not all contexts, in fact, few contexts, are such where you're able to do that. Uh, where you're, you know, you're, you remember you're already up close on somebody. Uh, so starting to draw your gun when you're three feet, four feet away from somebody might not always be the best play. Uh, so that, that draw may need to, part of the back pedal may, the purpose may be for you to get some time to get to the gun, to draw the gun. Uh, another al- alternate would be if you they get distracted for a moment. They look away. They're checking their surroundings uh, or they start talking to somebody else or whatever, and you get that brief opportunity where, oh, now it's my tar- my turn. And you can initiate that draw and then also start creating some distance as the gun is being used, as it's being put into, into the fight. Then that can work pretty well. But again, if we keep up the back pedal for too long, there's a high probability, like a 95% plus percent probability you're going down. Just go watch any number of dash cam footage uh, videos. So uh, if you are not comfortable with your current skill set as it relates to drawing and putting the gun into the fight quickly, then it might, in some contexts, make more sense for you to simply turn and run to really increase distance very quickly and while you're doing that, that may give you even more time, because maybe you're a slower drawer or whatever, to to draw your gun and then you know get to a position of advantage. Because running, turning around and sprinting, I'm a lot faster that way, and I can also look where I'm going, uh, avoid tripping, and maybe you know find a, a a position of cover where I can get to my vehicle, uh, a tree, a telephone pole, whatever. I don't know. It, you know, pick your poison. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Just you know, putting putting that into to context that it it it's. I had my my eye open to this. I know you want to go, but I'm yeah, just no, going to say something in a Kyle Lamb class a few years back, uh, when I was uh, we were doing some vehicle tactics, uh, coming out of vehicles, shooting around vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, and the we had a drill where it was you know draw from within the vehicle. I think no, we weren't shooting through the windshield on that one. Uh, but we were getting out of the vehicle. The gun was coming out. We were we were putting rounds down range onto the target, 
and then we were to retreat to the towards the rear of the vehicle and put additional rounds on target. And the way I first did it was I got came out of the vehicle, put rounds on target, and then I began moving my way backwards while facing the target, and I continued to put rounds on target until I got to the rear of the vehicle. Now I'm not saying that wasn't. I mean, I I got the job done, you know, and I made hits count. It was great. Uh, Kyle then demonstrated getting out, putting rounds on target, turning around, and sprinting, basically. Even though it's a fairly short distance, you know, we're talking 15 feet maybe, depending on however long this car is. Sprints to the rear of the vehicle, takes up uh, cover position again, and then puts more rounds on target. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, And he basically said all the things we're talking about here today, that, you know, one, like, you put yourself at risk of falling, of tripping. Uh, and you know what? This method and, and, and my me- your method and my method uh, were equally, equally as fast or perhaps even his method was slightly faster even just because he got to that position faster and he could put more effective hits on target even better um, at that point. So it's just some things to consider. Yeah, and, and you know, as you're talking um, I'm thinking about, you know, kind of, okay, somebody's sitting here th- listening to us and saying, all right, so I practice my draw. Um, I have a pretty decent draw, but sometimes when I fumble my draw, right, I don't get my shirt cleared or I get a bad grip or what it, whatever it might be. And ever that happens to everybody, right? It just happens less as you, as you practice it, right? So like everybody's prone to do something incorrectly, especially when you're trying to do it quickly uh, and and under stress. Now add in, and and the reason why we start with steps is add in movement. Well, if you're adding movement in, sometimes it it, it absolutely, not sometimes, it absolutely will complicate what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. It complicates the process of drawing. So, you know, you got to think that as I'm drawing my firearm and I'm trying to backpedal and do these things, it becomes more difficult for me to draw cleanly, get a good grip, and since I'm moving, putting put accurate shots on target. So, as as you're saying that, you know, it, it kind of underscores the 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 idea is, you know, yes, we want to create distance, um, but understand as we're moving, the draw becomes more difficult. Our feet moving. Um, it, it is another thing, you know, walking, chewing gum, most people can do two or three things at once, but once you start adding dynamic things, or I know you don't like that word, uh, you, 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 multiple different things that are moving at once, right? Like, and so it creates, uh, it's more difficult, right? So we don't want to, uh, if we can, we don't want to unnecessarily complicate the situation. Um, so when we're moving, yes, we have to move with the purpose. Backpedaling, probably not the best. Um, but why we start at the you know one-step shuffle type thing that you see on the range a lot is because you're starting to learn how to walk and chew gum, like draw and move at the same time, which is very, it becomes di- more difficult as you start doing different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. For the record, it's not that I dislike the word dynamic. I just <laughs> think that sometimes it's overused. Yeah, I heard I think, it twice. Think, yeah, <laughs> you're fired. Um, no, it was great. So, all right, moving to the rear. Again, I would just ask you to consider uh, certain contexts. Uh, imagine different scenarios where, you know, whether it's taking a few steps to the rear, uh, you know, while backpedaling or just, turning around and frankly if you got to cover a great amount of distance we're, so again the standard is if you got to go more than say three steps then turn around and run normal okay if it's just a couple of steps then backpedal right you know so uh it, it, it's both a safety thing as well as it is an efficiency thing yeah maybe so, like a defensive back think of a defensive back in football right mm-hmm. like they start backpedaling as the receivers come in they're backpedaling and then as soon as that guy's picking up speed they have to turn their body and actually move right yeah so maybe something like kind of if you have that yep. image in your mind that's a great point i actually like that as an example um you know and the whole reason they're backpedaling is to keep eyes on their receiver and and see okay where's he going where's he going and, you know and once they get a sense of where they think he's going and, and again after a couple of steps yeah you're exactly right then they got to turn around and actually run mm-hmm. yeah great great point uh, and I would say the same, you know, in a lot of defense contexts that, 
you know, you may be needing to deal with that problem that's right in front of you right then and there and get that initial solution put into place. And then it's like, now what, right? Now's the next next thing. Where am I going from here? Um, all right. So let's talk. I, I, I wanted to start with the back, you know, moving to the rear thing first, because uh, that's the, trick, the trickier one, I think. Um, and... and the purpose of that is, again, in most contexts, to create space and to buy time, and that's important. So that's that's the context, and that's the why behind it. And it comes with a big caution of, of how to avoid uh, tripping and falling down. When we start talking about other movements, uh, it, you know, the context may not be so clear at times. Um, so, in other words... Let's say we're going to move to the side. Well, I'd, have to, I'd ask the question, why are we moving to one side or the other? Where are we going? What's the point? Mm-hmm. And if it's, well, I'm trying to make myself more difficult to hit. Um, uh, well, again, that comes with the caution and the cautionary tale I gave earlier of how difficult is it really for somebody to track you, depending on how far and how fast you're moving to the side. And even... That, I mean, a lot of times, some of these thugs, you know, some of these bad guys, they don't really care what they hit. Uh, They're going to point that gun in your direction and start lighting the place up, you know. It's it's really a matter of time before a round connects with you. That's why it's so critical that we get good placement of shots on our bad guy uh, early on in the fight because the more opportunities they have to keep putting lead down – our direction, uh, eventually something is probably going to connect. Uh, my point here being that simply moving to the side, while it may sound good and while in theory it might make you more difficult to hit, that might not necessarily be true because a lot of times they just got to get lucky one time. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're moving, but it also compromises your ability to get good hits on your threat then you're just buying, you're not only buying, I guess, in theory, yourself more time, but you're giving them more time. Does that make sense? So that, I don't know, that I, I don't think that I consider that really a win. That's sort of a, well, this sounds good on the surface, but it also goes to my bad guy's benefit potentially as well, depending, yeah. you know, again, all context-based. Okay. So, so if I'm moving to the side, you know, one way or another, or, or it could be a very, like a sort of a hybrid where maybe I'm kind of moving sideways, but also sort of back or whatever. Uh, I think, and this is the title of the episode today, shooting and moving with purpose. Well, if you're going to the side one way or another, then it should be with a purpose in mind. What kind of purposes would you suggest, Matthew? Yeah. Like if you're moving behind cover, right? Like you're trying to get behind cover, um, maybe there's an exit there that you can get out of the building. Um, but yeah, it would be, you know, you're moving and potentially maybe you're get moving, uh, think of it this, uh, scenario, you're trying to move to create a different backdrop on your threat, right? Like maybe the backdrop that you have isn't good because there's a bunch of people, but if I move three or four steps this way, now I can engage in behind there's a brick wall or something like that, right? So I think those would be situations where maybe moving laterally might be ideal or, you know, uh, what you'd want to do rather than trying to create distance or close distance. Yeah. I think moving laterally is done almost exclusively with the purpose of I'm trying to get to this point. Okay, to to yeah, to get to cover, to get to a position of greater advantage, to change my angle. So you know, because my backstop here is not not good. I don't want to shoot this way. So I recognize I want to get here or there to to change the the angle that I'm shooting from. Uh, so yeah, all those things are valid purposes. But there should be yeah, my point here with lateral movement is it should be done with a purpose, a mission in mind. You know. There's a reason I'm doing this, and that reason is bigger than I'm just trying to make myself a harder target to hit. So another uh, direction would be towards a threat, potentially. Now, this may not be common, but Matthew, why might you want to move towards a threat? 
Yeah, I would say if somebody's already in your reactionary gap, meaning like you drawing the firearm is is not you're you're not going to be able to get the firearm into the into the fight quick enough, right? Or if you do draw, you're so close that it's pretty much ineffective because they can control your arm or, or redirect it. So maybe they have a knife and they're already in your reactionary gap. They're inside, and you have to deal with that threat, that that immediate threat, right? It's not okay, I can, this guy's swinging a knife at me, I can miraculously draw my gun and put shots and stop the knife in midair. It's not going to happen, right? So mm -hmm. now what am I going to do? I, maybe I have to step in to control that arm or, or to close the distance. Uh, maybe they do have a firearm, right? And, and I, I, I'm so close that if I reach out and I can control that arm and maybe pin the arm and I can move to my gun, um, that's better than me trying to run. Um, it would it, obviously, I hate to use the word situationally dependent because it's kind of a cop out sometimes, but it is situationally dependent. Like, you, you know, you have to make that judgment decision on the fly as say, if I move in, what are my chances of, of controlling this attack versus backing up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say to answer the same question would be, well, why do why do bad guys sometimes move towards actually oftentimes move towards their, their person or, you know, their victim they're trying to hurt. And I'd say a lot of times it's because they're trying to be aggressive. They're trying to be intimidating and they're trying to also increase the likelihood of success in what, what it is they're trying to do. Now, if that's trying to hurt you, then yeah, the closer they get, the easier uh, and most more likely it is that they can hurt you. So the same applies to us as so-called good guys uh, dealing with a bad guy. Now, so there is a trade-off, right? Because the closer I get, the more likely that I also get hurt. But there's context where it may make sense. And there, I've seen it, and I've actually I've talked to, to guys that were in situations where uh, they were involved in a shooting, and they, they closed in on their threat. And if you asked, you know, kind of like, why, why did you do that, or why would you do that, uh, if you're posing the question to someone who just has a lot of experience having been in a number of shootings, then the response sometimes would be because I was trying to end the fight right then and there, or they felt like, you know, that, that they just, it felt the, like the right thing to do. Sort of like I have the upper hand, I can end this right here, right now. And by closing aggressively and violently, you know, and, and shooting rapidly because the closer I get, the faster I can shoot. I knew it was going to end the fight right then and there, you know? Mm -hmm. So there, there's, uh, it's a risky play. It's a risky move, but sometimes it may be just the thing. It may be the thing that works. Uh, so, you know, contextually depends, you know, it, it depends on the situation, depends on the circumstances and yeah, might just be the thing. It just, you know, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. So, uh, but I would say that, and, and to your point, you covered it very well when, uh, when we're in close with somebody, I'll tell you what, especially if you are within arm's length, maybe a touch more than that, uh, or so just outside arm's length or, or within arm's length of somebody that's pulling out a gun, that gun is a distance weapon, right? I may not want to close in on a knife, depending. Again, it's situation dependent because mm -hmm. there's times too where that can, can work too. But on a gun, the gun's a distance tool. So if I can get it right up in close and tight, uh, I can make it a lot more difficult for them to connect with me with shots. Um, so, you know, yeah, that, that may play to your advantage. If you could step in, you might actually buy yourself time stepping in, obstructing their arm, their gun, whatever. Well, meanwhile, you're also retrieving your gun, and that's buying you the time to do that and put it into the fight. So, yeah, lots of things to consider here. Um, so let's see here. We're talking about context again. So we've been talking about moving to the rear, moving laterally, moving, moving forward <laughs> again, moving forward might also be a part of, uh, moving towards cover as well, or maybe, maybe I have to actually get closer to my threat, but I have better cover or something that's actually closer to them. So that may actually be more protective than me standing further back and I'm more exposed or more out in the open, that sort of thing. So that was one of the things I've, uh, I'd forgotten initially and just remembered I wanted to throw out there as well. Uh, 
Yeah, and, and, and Sean makes a good point. He added one thing that we missed He in the comments. He said, um, maybe one of the th reasons why we move is uh, to keep social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> no, good one. Good one, Sean. Yeah, well, right now it's the popular <laughs> thing, right? That's right. So, uh, okay, all right. I think the big thing here, the big takeaway is if you're going to move with a gun involved, right? So shooting, moving, if you're going to do so, you should have a purpose in mind for that movement. There's got to be a reason behind it. And it's, I, 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 I'm really, truly a believer of that reason's got to be bigger than I'm trying to be a more difficult target to hit. Right. Um, now, the actual movement itself. Let's, let's talk real quick about should you shoot while moving or should you move from, you know, maybe you're shooting at position A and then you move and then you get to position B and then you shoot again. What, what do you think, Matthew? What's best? What works better? Well, that's, that's a, a bit of a trick question. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It, it, and we're back to like kind of the situation. Dependent. But we, if we break it down and look at it and say, is it harder to shoot while we're moving or shoot while we're not moving? anybody's going to say it's more difficult to put accurate shots on target while we're moving. So, you know, if you need to put accurate shots on target, you may have to weigh that and say, I, if I'm moving, am I actually going to be able to put accurate shots? It's not like the military were using suppressive fire, right? Like if I keep their head down, you know, I just start lobbing bullets at them. They'll keep their head down and then I can move. That may be effective in some areas where there's nobody around, but in, you know, you don't have unlimited ammunition, right? So it, 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 we're not typically using suppressive fire. Um, most of the time as civilians, we're using accurate aimed fire to try to stop the, the threat. So mm -hmm. it, for me, like I'm thinking if it's a big open area that I have to cross and, and the, the the target maybe is seven yards away maybe I'm I'm just I'm just booking it I'm putting some rounds from behind cover and then I'm booking it um, if for whatever reason in the in, in the middle I, I need to start engaging targets because you know they're close now closing the distance on me and they're getting closer making it easier for me to shoot maybe now I start uh, putting rounds, but that may be a, a situation where I would choose to to run to another point, right, a, another point of cover, and then take up a position and immediately start shooting mm -hmm. if I, you know, needed to. Um, but if if it's a situation where I'm moving because I'm out in the open and I'm trying to get to cover, may and that person's pretty proximate, maybe you know I'm putting rounds as I'm moving because I, I really have no other option. Mm -hmm. Good response. I, I would say based on analyzing video and then also having been in force on force scenarios, uh, at both as a role player and also as a participant, that in most defensive contexts, it makes more sense to not shoot while moving. Mm -hmm. Okay. To, sh to have a position and shoot and then move because you need to move for a reason. So again, that movement in that kind of situation really kind of, I think, accentuates that there's a purpose behind that movement, right? Does that sure. make sense? Like if, you, if you're here and you are shooting and then all of a sudden you decide you got to move, well, you're moving probably for a reason if you're not moving while shooting. Uh, I would say in most contexts, it makes most sense to shoot, then move, then shoot. Mm -hmm. To be focused on the shooting being as good as it can be, the movement being as fast as it can be, and then the shooting again being as good as it can be. So when we see video, especially if it, when it's body cam footage, it, it makes it really easy to, uh, you know, to kind of to see this thing. And actually, well, here's a good example as well. Uh, not too long ago, um, uh, Axon, I think, is the company now that. Taser, Taser rebranded to, and they're making these uh, cameras that are mounting onto the light rail of mm -hmm. the gun. Yeah, uh, and they just published. You know, they, they just had their that first shooting they ever caught on a gun camera. Uh, did you see that one? I didn't. I, I saw the article and I just didn't get to watch the video yet. Yeah, I would recommend you watch it. Uh, it's really eye opening. Uh, it, it, the video is different, and so it's sometimes a little more difficult to track because it, it's a little bit harder to tell sometimes what the officer is doing because you're seeing it from the perspective of the gun. 
Um, and also, of course, the gun, you know, there's kind of this tremor, obviously, and things sort of blur together when the gun's firing and recoiling. But uh, uh, actually, you know, keeping that in mind, I'm actually kind of impressed now that I think about it with how good the quality actually is on that thing. But if you watch that one, most a lot of the shooting he's doing, okay, first he actually moves to the rear, and he trips and falls. He goes down. So mm-hmm. there's that point. And he gets up, and then he begins moving. Uh, keep in mind, the guy in the vehicle is trying to, like, run him over. Uh, so they're, <laughs> I'm not blaming this guy whatsoever as far as what, what he did or why he did, you know, what he did as far as uh, the, the officer perspective. But uh, he then starts, like, moving around. He starts flanking the vehicle, essentially. And he goes towards the rear and comes around to the other side. And the whole time he's shooting. Analyzing that one, very few of those shots were actually effective. You can see so many of them hitting the vehicle, uh, but not going where the guy's body would be or his head or anything like that. Um, And I think it's couple of reasons. I think the skill of this officer is probably not exceptional as far as shooting rapidly under pressure, especially while moving. Uh, just He just does not do a, an awesome job as far as making those hits count. Um, but does, in the end, does he get the job done? He does get the job done. He prevails, and that's that's the good thing. Um, and, and he deserves all the credit of that. But just using it as an example, this is not meant so much as a criticism as it is an example of he's trying to do a lot of shooting while he's moving, and a lot of those shots are not as effective as we'd like to see them be. Mm-hmm. So that's the point here. In most defensive contexts, unless your skill level is very high, uh, it's best, and even when it is high, I still think it's probably best in most instances to focus on the shooting focus on the moving being as good and as fast as it can be and then focus on the shooting some more yeah. if, if that's what the situation calls for totally agree yeah so um yeah that that's a really interesting thing to go look at so i would encourage anyone listening to the podcast today to, to just go watch any number of dash cam or body cam footages uh and and kind of look at some of these you know, maybe maybe some of what we've talked about today will actually have changed your 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 the way you look at these kind of things in the future, where you're actually analyzing a little bit more of the movement that the officer is doing and how it plays into that fight, and and looking for the good things as well as the less good things. I think those are all really valuable uh, things for us to try to learn and understand. Yeah, in in anything we do, right? Whether it's movement, movement of shooting, or why do we do a search and assess? Why do we do a, uh, mm-hmm. a chamber check? Why do we carry the gun we carry? All those things. Ask the question why. Like just be like your, I, I like my daughter. She asks the question why every to the point where I'm like, I don't even know why. Like why is this? Mm-hmm. Okay, I give her an answer. Why? 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 And then you get to the point where you're like, I don't know. <laughs> like I can't give you an answer. So yep. like analyze your stuff down down to the to where you're like okay i can give an answer to this and and i Mm -hmm. understand why why is such a powerful question man yeah you know uh it it is the intellectually lazy that don't like answering the question why right and 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 it's true at some points it gets to a point to to a place where you just don't know the why anymore to things and and you know when little kids are asking why uh, it, incessantly, it's you know, it's it's funny, and it's comical, and it's mm-hmm. uh, frustrating sometimes as a parent. You know, we've all been there. The, those of us that have kids, but uh, uh, but it's such a powerful question, yeah. you know. And and kids are naturally curious. They they want to know. They want to. Well, why is that? Why why, Dad? Did you tell me to do this? Why mm-hmm. am I brushing my teeth every night? Why is flossing every time I brush my teeth important? You know, like uh, just the they want to know the whys. And for some reason, we get older and we have a tendency to, I think some of it is that we think we know more than what we actually probably do. And so we're, we're perfectly happy to be complacent and comfortable with our, our current level of what we think of knowledge. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to not be intellectually lazy, to ask the questions, to ask the hard questions. You brought up scanning. It's such another. It's another great example of, you know, shooters that will run through a drill, get done, and then immediately, head goes you know left and right very quickly. Like scan, scan. Okay, good. Right. 
Um, it's like it's not a bad thing necessarily, but if you don't know why you're doing it, and if you're also not doing it in a way that makes sense contextually, right? Right. So, like on a square range, that's such a difficult thing to simulate and to simulate well. Uh, somebody mowing the lawn there. Yeah, next door. <laughs> that's funny. We hear. Like I hear it so well. Or something. It's all good. <laughs> But you know, if you don't, if you, it's just that's another one of those things where it's hard to simulate on a square range and to do it well, to do it accurately. Uh, I'm reminded of the video that uh, Pat McNamara put out a while back of of scanning, and he, you know, and he just he says what he says about that. If you go look that video up, is spot on um, as far as how he does and how he recommends doing a scan. And again, it comes back to the why and the context. Principle focused, context based. Um, the moving build drill. Okay, so this is a good question. You know, John here, who has been in some of our classes in the past, uh, we 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 do a drill that I call the moving build drill because it's six shots on a target, just like a build drill. Um, instead of being done at seven yards, it's done at five because it's done with movement. It's done on the move. And there's a reason why, as an instructor, I sometimes will use drills that are not necessarily what I would suggest is the best thing to do in a defensive context, but there's a reason why those drills are are done or taught. And in that instance, this would be one thing I would say. In that particular part of the class, one thing I'm trying to get students to learn is how to perform all of the shooting actions. Okay, so everything that's going on shooting-wise, that that is performed independently of what the body is doing, what the movement's doing. Okay, to, to start teaching the idea that that uh, you can sh you can do a lot more than what you think you can do uh, shooting, right? And the upper body should be independent of the lower body. Our foundation of shooting is from the waist up. I don't care so much what, what's going on with your feet. You can stand with some goofy, weird foot stance. As long as it's somewhat balanced, your upper body is doing what it should do. Like That's where the foundation truly begins for shooting is from the waist up. The lower body, its only important job in, in relation to the shooting is that you're balanced. You're not going to tip over or you're not letting that recoil push you over uh, unnecessarily. And so doing drills like that moving build drill starts instilling in the student that, hey, I because you're, you're kind of moving, you're moving laterally. And so as you're doing that, the body is forced to continually turn, you know, orient to the target as the lower body continues moving the direction it's moving. And so that's really what we're trying to get at is I'm trying to, uh, it's not so much because I see that that drill has relevance to an actual defensive context as it, as it is, we're just trying to teach different skill sets and, and there's ways we can kind of isolate those and bring those out and bring those to the focus, um, to help the student begin expanding on their already existing, you know, shooting skill set. Cause not a lot of shooters get the opportunity to really do some of that stuff. And so that's why we do some of those drills. There's there's other reasons I could go into, but it not as, it's not as relevant or critical to the discussion that we're doing here today. So good 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 question though. Yeah. Um, that's a that's an excellent question. So uh, I think we're kind of at that hour mark, so we probably ought to wrap it up. Um, even though I probably could go still further deeper on this, and I think you could too, Matthew. Yeah. Um, I do want to give you one last uh, opportunity to throw out any remaining thoughts, but uh, but I think the if I was summarizing things from my perspective here today is with regards to movement in a defensive context where a gun's involved and we're shooting, ask yourself the reasons why you do what you do, understand those, apply the appropriate tactics based on the circumstances. Yeah. And I would just add in there, you know, we use the term get off the X. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean an X the size, you know, a, a foot by foot by foot grid square, right? The X is a, a large area that you're you're fighting in, right? So it's like, um, don't, don't be narrow focused or narrow minded to think, 
we're just talking about moving one step laterally or two steps or three steps even. It might be six steps, but it might be two steps to cover. So think of the purpose like like Riley, like you were saying, and and think of the big picture type thing. Mm-hmm. That's right. It, you know, it's at the end of the day, a gunfight's a, a still a fight. Mm-hmm. And and so it is getting off the X to me means that I'm going to employ, employ whatever tactics necessary to win that fight, you know, that, that make the most sense based on what, you know, the circumstances. So it's, it's not about a pre-programmed one size fits all. I'm going to do this thing when I draw and fire my gun every time. That's not getting off the X. Uh, you might think you're getting off the X. You might've been taught that that's what you do to get off the X, but that's not getting off the X. Everything else we've talked about today is mm-hmm. more, you know, there, again, there's still more we could talk about, but this is a stepping stone. This is a good place to start and a good place for us to all ask ourselves where we are at, where we're going, uh, and whether we're getting better or not each day. So there you go. Again, today's episode is sponsored by Guardian Nation. GuardianNation.com is where you can learn more, and there's actually a good number of videos in the Guardian Nation members area about movement and how to do it and how to do it well uh, as far as you know some various specific things as far as how you might move how you might step uh, that kind of stuff that that makes things a little bit better uh, in terms of shoot, shooting and moving uh, but there's tons of other great content in the Guardian Nation members area so check it out GuardianNation.com and again a 14 day free trial available to you guys all uh, by using the link concealedcarry.com forward slash 14 day, 14 day. And that should, that link should actually automatically add, because it's the only way you can find this. It'll automatically add a 14 day free trial to your shopping cart and you check out, and then you'll have access uh, for free for 14 days. And then after that, of course, you know, you have the option to, to continue on and, and pay. But I think the money's well worth it. And uh, we try to bring, you know, the best content we can to our members. Uh, Appreciate all of you that support us and the podcast. And guys, if you have any questions or topic suggestions or whatever, hit us up. Email us at support, not support. That's for, why why does that come out all of a sudden? Podcast (laughs) at concealedcarry.com. I guess you can email support at at concealedcarry.com, but uh, but the most direct way would be to contact us at podcast at concealedcarry.com. We hope to hear from you. Thanks so much. You guys take care. Have a great day. We'll see you again next week with more Shop Talk and the Concealed Carry Podcast. So with that, a reminder to train right, train often, and train safe so you can fight hard, fight fast, and fight true. Take care. Oh, my neck feels stiff. (laughs) Hey guys, thanks all for being a part of this show today. Uh, you guys are awesome. I know I kind of ignored some questions. There were a lot of great questions. Um, I might come back through here and respond to some of these uh, directly. Uh, but uh, yeah, good stuff. I'm glad that it looks like some of you enjoyed the episode, so I appreciate that. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah, thank you guys. So, all right, we're going to let you go. You all take care, and we'll see you next week.